we know a little bit from your introduction, David, about the genesis of this um, book, about how you were embedded um, for the first book, and then how you came home, and, and, and how you sought out these guys again. But I wonder if, Roxana, you can tell us a little bit about the genesis of Sparta, and what, um, what brought you to this topic, and what made you decide to, to, to go with it and to write this novel? Um, it was really nothing I was thinking of. It was, it was a complete surprise to me. Um, it was an article, it started with an article that I read. It was on the front page of the New York Times. I was talking to David earlier and he said, what was the article? But because, it, because at that time it never occurred to me I was going to write this book, I had no reason to remember it. But it was a front page article about um, what it was like to be one of our troops in Iraq at that moment on the ground, and it documented the the way um, the way the troops were being used, and they were being put into these unarmored Humvees and sent out on patrols until they were blown up, and they had no control over it, and they had no kind of protection, and they were getting traumatic brain injuries, and the military uh, medical services were refusing or reluct being reluctant to diagnose the injuries because it would mean withdrawing combatants from the field and because it was, it, was, um, it was expensive to treat them. And I was really shocked and horrified to read this, this constellation of facts. And I had never been in favor of the war, I had never voted for Bush, but I thought that since we were the greatest military force in the world, that we, when we sent people into war, they would be properly prepared and they would be well protected. And those things were not true. So I was, I was just, I was just appalled. And so I started reading everything I could find about that fact, what it was like being there on the ground. Um, and it was a subject that was very new to me. I, um, I'm actually a Quaker, so I didn't really know very many people who were in the military world at all. Um, so when, when the moment came, when I had been reading book after, I mean article after article, and I became just completely obsessed with this subject, and I realized that I was going to be doing what I ended up doing, which was writing a book. I was really horrified, because it seemed like such a huge project that I wouldn't be able to engage with. Um, but for a writer, you get to a point, and that's, you don't, you don't really have much of a choice at that point. So I was, I was in the thick of it. And I'm curious, David, as you were writing your book, the book, one of the great strengths of this book is that it reads so like a novel, in a sense, you know, it's, it has the same emotional balance as a novel, and it has the same momentum, and I wonder, did you read much about similar things? Did you read many novels? Did you read other books about this kind of a circumstance as you were doing this? Well, I, you know, I grew up, I'm sure like most of us, <laughs> I grew up reading a lot. And mostly what I read was fiction. And so there was this, uh, and I was at the University of Florida, and I was taking a class with this uh, writer, Harry Cruz. Uh, maybe you guys have heard of him. Um, and it was pretty cool. You were supposed to write short stories. And, uh, and I wrote one and turned it in. And uh, the deal was, you know, you read it out loud. Uh, uh, he reads it out loud. He doesn't say who wrote it. He just reads it, and everybody weighs in. Mm -hmm. So he read mine. Nobody said anything for a while. And then finally somebody said, I'll bet that was written by a girl. <laughs> and I, I didn't know enough then to take that as a compliment. <laughs> And then nobody said, it was, it was awful, it was awful. <laughs> uh, and it was pretty clear to me that, that, that I may like to read fiction, but uh, I should never, ever, ever write fiction. <laughs> but at the same time, this was in the late 70s in Florida, there was this type of journalism making its way out of ma magazines and newspapers, this kind of uh, uh, law enforcement, whatever you want to call it, anthropological journalism, blah, blah, blah. Hold on, I started reading this stuff in the Miami Herald and the St. Pete Times, and I thought, this is pretty cool, I'm going to try to do this. And then uh, developed a career where 
that became pretty much the only thing I can do in journalism, which is to 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 go and and and, 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 to, and to watch and to stay and to stay and to stay and to stay until the story develops and not write the story. And uh, you know, that's what I've been doing all along, and, and sort of writ large in, in this case. Uh, so when the Good Soldiers came out, one of the uh, I'm sorry, can you just hear me if I don't? Is that okay? So one of the reviews of The Good Soldiers had this line, great line in it. Yeah, you know, I remember every bad review, but I do remember this <laughs> nice line of the, this good review that said, you can take this book off the shelf five years from now and reread it and think, this is what happened and this is how it felt. And that's pretty much what I'm trying to get to uh, in the work I do. This is what happened. It, and and, and I'm, I'm, I think these books, this is what happened. This is a corner of the war that I didn't expect anyone to read these things, but I did want to document the far end of policy, what was going on uh, in the corner of this significant war being fought by the soldiers. Uh, so that's what happened, and uh, yeah, this is how it felt. And, and as treacly as that question is, how did it feel, how did it feel, I, I kind of was sort of uh, flush with an embarrassed sense of pride when I read that line in, in, the, in the review that I'm glad that came across. Because I am, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, here's what it comes down to. Uh, stories matter, uh, uh, and these stories matter. And, uh, and whether it's, it's, it's Sparta, which I finished last night and, and really put me in a, in a, in a foul mood because it was so good. And, <laughs> I mean, that not, not because it was just technically good, because it got it, it's right. And, and so all of a sudden I was, I was immersed once again in, in, in the lives of these, these people I know so well from my own reporting. What, so whether it's fiction or non-fiction, you know, some stories really matter. And, and what's happening now, uh, as, as these wars wind down, and, uh, and two million uh, Americans who have deployed into these wars, they didn't create the policy. <coughs> Forgive me, this, I'm almost done. They didn't create the policy. These are stories about people who carried out policy. That was their job. And, and the unit I was with, these 800 guys, I got lucky, it was a very good unit. Uh, they tried as hard as they could. And for some of them, not all of them, but for some of them, doing that job has led them to come home into these invisible and lonely lives where they are screwed up. And who wouldn't be? Because this was tough stuff. Every war is, I get that, but so was this one. And, 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 and what these folks did, and, and then now what they're dealing with in, in, in the aftermath, was anything, anything, any book, that can bring attention to this and make people who don't really care about these wars care about the people who were in these wars, that's, that's pretty good for them. You, you mentioned, David, that it, in talking about your process in general, um, about an almost, maybe the wrong word, but an anthropological focus and, a, and um, the use of um, what I guess in anthropology are called informants and, and you know, people who, <coughs> who are telling you their stories and you're trying to report that um, faithfully and, and, and in a way that can um, tell the story truly, which is not always such an easy thing even when the story's been told to you. But I think there's a sense sometimes that, that um, in journalism you do that and in fiction, you don't. You just sit in a room and make it up and don't talk to anyone, and you can write anything you want. And so I'd like you, Roxana, just to talk a little bit about um, your informants and the process you used in the, and the men and women you spoke with, too. Um, yeah, it's, it's a funny kind of hybrid, um, writing this kind of fiction. And I, and I also think a lot of people are writing fiction that draws them outside their own zone. The old adage, which is, write what you know, is really being stretched. And so many people are writing historical novels and novels about wars that they weren't in. So I think we're, we're all doing this kind of thinking and this kind of writing. Um, 
for me, it involved a, an enormous amount of research, lot, reading lots of books, of whom um, I, and I read both David's, which are really, really great war books. Um, and I and I needed to talk to vets. I needed to talk to people who were a different generation, different gender, different world from mine completely. Um, and it was, I think, all of this this process, this finding informants and winning their trust, um, is difficult if you're an anthropologist or a journalist or a novelist. But um, it, it's particularly hard for a novelist. I mean, as a novelist, you aren't. You, I'm not an investigative reporter. I don't have the instinct to go and collar people and get them to tell me their life stories. And so I tend to, to sit and listen. But I had to find vets who would talk um, in front of me. So it was that was a slow and challenging process. But but it was great. And one of the things that I learned about the Marines, I chose Marines to, to write about, um, was how much fun they are. And uh, I was looking at this as, you know, this dark subject, which it is, but um, I, there was this enormous bonus of getting to know these young men who were smart and so vital and so interesting. Um, so my world was, was expanded at the same time um, as I was learning about this very dark passage in, in our country's history. Um, the the guys that I talked to. Well, one of the one of the interesting things for me is one source that I thought I might use was to teach um, vets in writing creative writing uh, workshops, which is which is one way. There, there are lots of creative writing work, workshops for vets across the country, and I volunteered for a number of them, and I was always turned down. Um, and I for for a variety of reasons. I don't know what they were. Um, but I, but I also was anxious about the ethics of it because I sort of thought that if I, I couldn't teach a class like that without telling the people that I was there writing to write a book, and as soon as I told them that I was writing a book, that would change our relationship, and they would then be wondering about whether or not they should be as candid in front of me as they would otherwise. So I never, I never had to go through that um, that process. But there were lots of I became aware of the fact that journalists have a very different set of ethics and a different way of going about this than novelists who just generally listen to people at dinner parties and then go home and write books about them. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty good. <laughs> I like that. Do you want to respond to that, David? Because I, I think one of um, the questions I had as I was reading both books was that um, how do you both as writers honor and be faithful to the relationships that you've had with the people who have informed you um, and how deep does that process go do you clear what you read do you uh, what you've written do you not clear it what what are the limits of, of the your ethical responsibilities yeah that's that's uh, that's for that's a pretty large subject um, <laughs> sorry well look this was the case where the work I mean, the kind of work I do, it's, it's something hasn't happened yet. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not a thing where something has happened and then you go interview people about what happened and then, and then you imagine it into a narrative. Um, for the kind I do, I, I, I sort of show up at what's presumed to be a beginning point and I just kind of hang out and hope or wait, uh, wait for a story to develop out of this. I mean, when I went to Baghdad, uh, with these guys. I didn't know if anything would happen to them. There was, there was no guarantee that it, there would be a story at all. And, and, and of course there was one. It was, it was, I guess it was, if, if I had written The Good Soldier's is Fiction, uh, it would be deservedly dismissed as, as just, you know, amping something up ridiculously. Just, but, but, it, but in fact it happened. Um, the, uh, so I show up, and, uh, and it's not like when I showed up in Baghdad, these 800 soldiers trusted me. Uh, in fact, it was, it was uh, almost uniformly the opposite. Uh, they didn't know what a journalist is or does, and, and really, why would they, right? It's, it's, it's just they were, they were responding to stereotypes and caricatures of reporters in, 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 in movies. Uh, Pretty, in some cases, actually, they're based on truth, but not always. Uh, 
So I show up. And, and as far as they were concerned, um, uh, I had an agenda, even though I didn't. Uh, I was part of the liberal press. Uh, every soldier was a war criminal or a baby killer. Uh, rumors. I had been hired by the battalion commander to write his biography. <laughs> Not true. Uh, no matter what, if, if, if a soldier talked to me, I would immediately run to the battalion commander and say, guess what? Guess what he said? Not true. But it's not like I could call everybody together and say, here's the deal. Here's what a journalist is and does. So, so what happened is, I think over time, uh, you know, I've, I've tried to talk about this before, and I do it clumsily, but, but the fact that I didn't visit this story, uh, the fact that I stayed with that, that I didn't drop in for a weekend, and then go back to the States and end up on, on CNN or, 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 or Fox or somewhere opining on the success of the surge, uh, that I came in with questions and not answers. And I stayed, you know, week after week, month after month. That, that helped establish credibility. Uh, when I was out with the soldiers and something bad happened, and, you know, this was a tough deployment. Bad things happened all the time. And, and so let's say uh, a roadside bomb went off and, uh, and the smoke clears and the dust settles and the soldiers realize they're alive and they look around and this guy among them is just taking notes. Or maybe I had my digital recorder out, but I, I wasn't a problem. I, I wasn't causing a problem. I wasn't screaming. I wasn't panicking. I was just there doing the job as a journalist. This helped them understand us. Oh, so this is part of the drill. This is what the guy does. So, you know, over time they did trust me and more and more began to talk to me about what they were thinking or going through or not minding if I was along with them watching. And, you know, the other great advantage I had was this, this, this place we were at in East Baghdad. It was, it was pretty lousy. It's not like there were a lot of choices there for the soldiers to talk to. So at the end, it was, <laughs> it was either me or the chaplain. And, uh, <laughs> and I got the good deal on that one, too. <laughs> So more guys began talking to me, and and trust developed. And so 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 the, the other side of this is, I mean, look, these are people who, on a given day, might be doing something to save my life, right? So what's my obligation to them? Uh, let's say there was a guy who had done something to save my life, and three months later, it turns out this guy is being brought up on charges of rat fucking Iraqis. What do I do? Guy saved my life, but now he's being brought up on charges. It's easy, it's easy. You write the story. The obligation isn't to the people in this battalion. I mean, I wanna treat them, I wanna, I wanna make sure I'm, I'm representing them authentically, but, but I think this is true of any writer. The obligation is to the story you're trying to tell. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Awesome. And do you agree with um, It's different for a novelist. So what I felt was, um, as a novelist, you don't. There's no way that you can tell someone you're interviewing that you're going to protect them because you you don't know what you're writing. So you can't guarantee that their story will be in it at all. You can't guarantee that it won't be in it. You can't guarantee that it will be in the form that they've told you. Um, all I, what I want to know when I interview people is, well, as David said, what was it like for you? being there then? What was it like for you in that moment? So I, I want to hear what the most powerful moments were for them. But I can't guarantee them anything. Um, so the way I went about that, and, I, and I'm, I'm not trained as a reporter or as a sociologist, so I had to make this up, but um, I, I started out by asking them very simple questions. Where, where, you, where were you born? And, and when did you go into the service? And things like that. And I said, um, you're in control of this this um, interview. You can stop it at any time. If I ask you a question you don't want to answer, don't answer it. It's completely your, you, you talk about what you want to talk about. Um, and, but I also made them feel, the ones that I, that I ended up talking to did trust me. Um, and one moment that I realized how we were both negotiating this was um, <clears throat> there was one man who was a Navy captain who got in touch, I got in touch with him through a friend of his. 
And we emailed for a while, and then he said, do you want to come up and interview me? And I said, yes, I'd like that. And he lived way in upstate New York. And so we made a date, and we were going to meet at a cafe at 6 o'clock on a certain day. So I drove. It was a four-hour drive. So I drove all the way up there, got there a little early, walked into the cafe, which is called Jitters. And, <laughs> and it was about as big as this room. And I walked in, and there were maybe four tables. And one of, at one of them, there was a man who looked up when I came in, and I figured it was my guy. And we both sort of made eye contact. But he was sitting with a beautiful young woman and a six-year-old child. And I went over and said, Mike, and he said yes. And I, they, um, it was his wife and his daughter. And I thought, OK, this is not going to be the interview that I was expecting. But that's fine. So we sat down and talked. And, and his wife was really interesting. And she told me a lot about what, what it was like for her. Um, and then we had dinner. And then the wife and child left. She said, well, I'll see you later. And I said, oh, so you're not together. And he said, no, um, I wanted her to be here when you got here, because we didn't know what you would be like. So she was his security. And um, it, he was absolutely right. I, he, he didn't know what I was going to be like. I might have been awful and, <laughs> and abrasive and intrusive. And, and he wouldn't have wanted to talk to me. And so his wife, they would never have said anything about coming in two cars. And they would have all left after the soup. Um, so I was very conscious that there were two sides to this, and I have stayed in touch with a lot of the people that I interviewed, and I was very careful. Um, I did feel very protective of them and very um, conscious of the fact that I did owe them something. I owed them a lot for, for their trust, and so um, I would never have... I only used a few whole anecdotes that people had told me. Um, other than that, I was using people's thoughts and their feelings and the way they had responded to, to the world. But I didn't use I didn't use anybody's story, and I certainly I don't think I made anyone feel embarrassed or ashamed of of the, their actions or the way they were portrayed. Because I I, I was di it was different for me. I, I owed these guys. Well, well, so you have me thinking now. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is, is that on the second book, especially this, this new book, Thank You for Your Service, this is not in war, this is after everybody's home. Uh, this is families now undergoing, and I'm the same deal, I'm embedding with these families, uh, watching, watching them try to heal from psychological wounds. And I gotta tell you, this is, this is, it, it is so intimate and it's so brutal at times what they're going through. And, and the, the names are real. The quotes are the quotes. Everything in, in, in these books, because especially partly because it's journalism and partly because the wars are so controversial, um, uh, big publisher, books are getting attention, have to make sure especially that everything is, is, is bulletproof and defensible. So look, the names are real. The quotes are the quotes. Uh, uh, this is what happened. And, and one of the weird things is, so I write the book and I get to move on. Uh, these people may never be in a book again. This may be their moment of, of you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to make too much of this, but this is a public moment. And, and they are being seen at the very worst moments, not only of their lives, but pretty much any life. Crying, fighting, screaming. Guns in mouths, guns against heads. Uh, uh, a guy trying to get his wife to kill him, and his wife so much she wants to kill him. And this is this this is on these pages, and and the paper stock seems pretty good. So so it's not like this stuff's going to fade anytime soon, right? <laughs> so uh, and then they also know from the beginning that they don't get to see the book until it's published. That's just part of the deal because. Because if they see it beforehand, then, then you know, it's tainted journalism. Uh, they've become their own editors. It, really, they've become the censors of their story, and, and that just can't be. So there, so there is a lot of, a lot of trust involved, and, uh, and it makes it tough. And, and, and anybody, who's, look, anybody who does this and pretends that they make the right call every time about what to include, what not to include, how to think, you know, if they're all full of 
right. and boastfulness if they get it right. It's just shit. I mean, I mean, I mean, you have a broad set of guidelines you try to operate within, and then, and then, and then within that, you just moment by moment do the best you can. It's uh, so I, I'm not trying to sound harsh by saying I don't owe them anything, but I guess. Maybe maybe this is uh, uh, a, a refuge or something, but what I owe them is to tell the best version of their story uh, that I can. That sounds pretty hot, but I guess it's what I come down to. And, and I think what's so riveting about that, I was thinking, as, as you were both talking about um, the women, when, when I read these two books, I was so struck by um, the parallels between the story of Adam and Saskia and and the story of Conrad and Claire, not necessarily in, in the details of what actually happened, but in the in the emotional content of those relationships, they're so similar. And there are times when, um, in both cases, um, as a reader, frankly, you want to. Um, hate, hate the families, hate the woman, and yet you both <coughs> are so successful in bringing the reader back um, out of that feeling and into some deeper sympathy with these women. And so I wanted you both to address that a little bit. Um, you tell us the magic formula for that. I know you can do that. <laughs> but can you talk a little bit about um, those marriages, those women, both in the novel, or those relationships, it's not a marriage, but those relationships in those women and why um, and how you worked through that as writers. Um, well for me, I, I, I just thought it was so interesting moving through this relationship between Claire and Conrad because, um, you know, women are meant to be the nurturers and, and they're meant to be the comforters and they're meant to be. This, the ones who deliver solace and support, and in this situation, it's nearly impossible. And so these women try over and over to deliver something that they can't deliver, and they they can't pull it out of themselves. So um, that became just this sort of repetitive Chinese box that that, that they couldn't get out of. Um, and the rage in, in a normal situation. In people who don't have PTSD, everyone has fights, you go through them, you both get angry, you both reach a pitch of rage and you're saying things that you don't mean to say, or you do mean at the moment, and then you both calm down, that diminishes. But with somebody in this situation who keeps replaying the loop of rage, you can't get past it. And so for the women, the women were drawn into this cycle of, of um, Dysfunction is a terrible word, but but into this cycle of being unable to move forward to to make the relationship functional. So they were stuck. They were in conflict. They were in this nightmarish tangle, just the way the men were. Um, and in yeah. and in and in your book, David, um, for a number of them, um, they're no stranger to rage either. No, no, Sasuke Schumann. Uh, I guess my version is Claire. That's uh, you know, Adam Schumann comes home from the war uh, early, and you know, he's filled, he's, it, it doesn't matter that, that he served uh, a thousand days in combat and, and he's done well. The fact that he has to leave early, he's still tasting Emory's blood and various other things. He can't do it anymore. And he leaves, he leaves and he gets on a helicopter and he comes back to the States and as he catches a little plane to Manhattan, Kansas, and he comes down the steps and he's walking across the tarmac. He so was wishing that, that he was missing a leg or an arm or he could look in the mirror and see some physical representation of injury so he would actually believe that there's something wrong with him. And instead, you know, as, as he keeps saying, I'm a pussy, I'm a pussy, I'm weak. What is this thing? Um, he's gaunt, he's haunted. That's him walking across the tarmac. Here's Saskia, his wife. This is the homecoming, right? This is what she wanted. She wanted the guy out of the war to be home so the family could get on the business of being a family. And she has her own imagination of what the moment is going to be. And then she looks out the window of this little airport and sees who's walking toward her. 
and just her heart drops. She gets it. You know, this is this is not good. And and so it's just, just like like uh, it was for for Claire. Uh, the reality of Saskia was a steady progression from uh, this this hopeful moment to just out and out fury. She 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 became one of the most furious people I've, I've, I've ever I've encountered in so many years of reporting. And uh, so then, so it becomes an interesting question whether, whether um, no matter what form you're writing, when you have a character who is, I, I mean, I, I remember Roxanne in the middle of reading her books, said, how do you sustain uh, a maddening character? And uh, uh, because I was, I was getting really irritated at, 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 at Conrad and, and, and Claire as I read the book. I was, I was getting a little annoyed with everybody, just like in real life, that I was spending time about him in Saskia. I, I, I could feel myself some days just losing the writer's ability to try to stand in someone else's shoes. And I was, instead of trying to understand, I was judging, not, not a healthy thing as a writer, but I was judging them and just getting furious. And it just, there was a constant recalibration how to remove myself from reacting as a human being almost and getting back to the posture of being a writer trying to understand.